Well, that was a heartwarming, cheerful bit of scripture we heard this morning to begin the season of Advent. Once a year, we hear that same scripture out of the mouth of Jesus like we do every year on this Sunday. He describes a world gripped by fear, a world that is anxious, noisy, confused. Creation is in chaos. Sounds like he's describing our world. And then he describes how the world copes with all of that chaos, getting drunk, self-medication, Denial, numbless distractions. It still sounds like he's describing our world. He says, this generation will not pass away until this happens. This generation, our generation, every generation. We tend to forget that the season of Advent begins in pain. We forget that because we do so much to cover our pain. In our world, Advent has become a season of cocktail parties, overeating, overspending, all of those behaviors that we engage in to help us cope. O come, O come, Emmanuel. That's a cry of deep, deep longing from a place of intense pain. It was sung by the captives in Israel. They were singing a song that the prophet Isaiah wrote. They were captives in Babylon longing for Messiah, longing to go home. And then 500 years later, we hear another song. It's sung by Mary. She's unwed pregnant, poor, a nobody Jew living under Roman occupation, but she also sings a song. We call it the Magnificat. And in that song, she longs for God to turn the world upside down. Jesus' mom was a revolutionary. She wasn't Mary Mild and Meek. She was a revolutionary. And if you want to read about her radical politics, open your Bible after the, this afternoon to Luke chapter 1. Advent begins among people who are in pain, fed up with the way the world is going and longing for deliverance, a prince of peace, an end to violence, exploitation, greed, suffering, longing for God to make the world right. Advent is deeply subversive for the powers that be. And whoever is in power knows what the threat of Advent is. Do you know how the prophet Isaiah died? He was sawn in two. That's how awful his message was. That's how threatening it was. Herod massacred children, of course, in order to prevent a regime regime change. Our American culture does an incredibly efficient job of silencing the hope of Advent through the anesthesia of nostalgia for Christmases of long ago and shopping. And so we shouldn't be surprised when the president refuses to hold a powerful despot accountable for an assassination because it might cost America some money. Mary, on the other hand, Mary, the mother of Jesus, sings of a God who throws the powerful from their thrones and sends the rich away empty. Mary had hope. Now, Matt knew what the gospel reading is for this first Sunday of Advent, and he pointed me toward a comment that he read on Twitter, and I think it perfectly expresses the meaning of the first Sunday of Advent. It's from Pastor Lenny Duncan. I'd never heard of Lenny Duncan before. He's the pastor of a black open and affirming Lutheran congregation. Imagine that, a black, open, and affirming Lutheran congregation. The last Lutheran I was, church I was at, it was named after St. Olaf, and, <laughs> and it was full of Norwegians in North Dakota. That's probably why Reverend Duncan has a book coming out next year called Dear Church, A Love Letter to the Whitest Denomination in America. <laughs> Well, apparently Pastor Duncan gets together with a group of other pastors every week to discuss the upcoming lectionary texts. And this is what he tweeted this past week. I was at my local pastor's text study yesterday, and when Luke 21, 25 to 36 came up, I was excited. So I was asked by a peer, why? Why do you love this text? I replied, as an oppressed person, as a black man, the destruction of the systems of this world are the gospel. He's absolutely right. Advent announces the destruction of the systems of this world, and that's why, in solidarity with anyone living under oppression today, we've lit the candle of hope. We wait to hear those words once again, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall rest upon his shoulders. We wait to hear, unto you is born this day a savior, in the city of David, which is the Messiah, the Lord. We long to sing again with angels, peace on earth, 
and mercy mild God and sinners reconciled because joy to the world the Lord has come that earth receive her king. Advent is for people who are fully aware of what's wrong with the world and who are awake with the hope that one day the earth shall be filled with the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. So what is Christian hope? Well, two years ago today, if you were here, you might remember that I preached about how Joe had just moved to Honolulu uh, three months earlier. That's my partner. And I said I was trying to live expectantly for his return, the second coming of Joe, making the bed, (laughs) making the bed, things that he would do, doing the dishes, keeping things ready as if at any moment he might walk through the door and come home. Well, it's been two years now of waiting, and I'm still making the bed, at least on most days, but this exile is getting old, and it really shows no immediate prospect of ending. We're still waiting. In these two years, we've learned a great deal about grief. We've learned a great deal about what it means to long intensely for something, and I hope and I pray earnestly every day for this exile to end. And that's a hope that I know that anybody living in our situation would hold on to. It's a human hope, and it's a very good hope. But it's not what the Christian hope of Advent is about. Advent hope isn't about a particular chain of events happening, like Joe gets a job back in Chicago, moves home, and we live happily ever after. Christian hope isn't focused on an event like that, like finding a spouse, getting a new job, or a new president. Christian hope isn't even about going to heaven when you die. Did you hear that? Christian hope isn't about going to heaven when you die. Christian hope is focused intently upon God, and in particular, the coming of the kingdom of God to earth. That's the hope that Jesus taught us to pray, that we say every Sunday that we just said, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Heaven coming to earth. That's what we're waiting for. And we inherited that hope from our older brothers and sisters, the Jews. Now, the difference is that while they still await the Messiah to be born, we believe the Messiah was born in Jesus Christ. And in him, the kingdom of God has come near, and it's still coming near. He is the one who was and is and is to come. The kingdom of God is always at hand. It's always near because Christ is near, and he is always coming to us. And he is especially close and near to people who are in pain, people who are longing for relief. And so we hear Christ say, lift up your heads. The kingdom of God is near. So how do we receive the kingdom of God? Jesus told his disciples earlier in the Gospel of Luke that if you wish to enter the kingdom of God, you must become like a little child. Well, what does that mean? How do we become like children? If we're all grown up, if we're middle-aged, if we're in our old age, how do we enter the kingdom of God like children? Children embody hope. Their future is open. Children are full of promise. Unto us a child is born. Unto us a daughter is given. Children love to make believe. They love to imagine that a different world is possible and then to live in that imaginary world as if it were true. Magical kingdoms of fairy princesses, magical kingdoms where heroes can fly. To become like little children is to open ourselves to God's dream for the world, open to new life, open to change, hands stretched out to receive a gift-wrapped package of God's grace waiting for us beneath the tree of life. If you go to the city of Rome and you visit the catacombs of Calixtus, which are along the Appian Way, you can see a place where ancient persecuted Christians used to secretly bury their dead underground. And when they did that, they painted these frescoes on the catacomb walls, and they still exist. They're our earliest examples of Christian art. And in some of those paintings, people are shown praying. But their heads aren't bowed down and their hands aren't folded, and their eyes aren't closed. Our ancient Christian ancestors prayed standing up on their feet with their hands raised, their eyes open, looking up to heaven like expectant children, eager and anticipating to receive a gift from God. Do we really want to see the kingdom of God come? 
Or are we simply satisfied with the way things are or just cynical? Jesus said, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born again. If we want to see the kingdom of God, then we must become like little children, born again, born with new eyes, born into the kingdom that was born with the Christ child. The kingdom of God, however, isn't make-believe. It's not a fairy tale realm. In the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, we have seen that it is real. We have touched it. We've seen it with our eyes. It's a kingdom where people matter more than money. It's a people where a kingdom where every life is cherished and everyone has enough. It's a kingdom that refuses to rule by violence, but by love. And it's a kingdom where the only people that are on the outside are there by choice because the kingdom of God has no border walls and no security guards. Isaiah could see that kingdom coming. He could imagine it. And so he's saying, O come, O come, Emmanuel. Mary could see that kingdom coming. She could imagine it. And so she's saying, Magnificat anima mea, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. Can you see the kingdom of God? Can you imagine it coming? If you can't, then this Advent season you must be born again. Lift up your heads toward the coming Christ. Open your eyes with the hopeful imagination of a little child. And live as if the the dream that God imagines for the world is true. Amen.